In 2009, this article made sure the world knew that phone hacking by journalists at Britain's biggest selling Sunday tabloid News of the World was much worse than anyone first thought. It would become one of the most grievous corporate scandals of our time. Royals, celebrities, a murdered schoolgirl systematically hacked in pursuit of a story. We're talking about murder victims, potentially terrorist victims, having their phones hacked into. It is absolutely disgusting. This moment where the British public and now an international public has seen just how repulsive these people are. The man behind these revelations is reporter Nick Davies, described by his supporters as Britain's greatest investigative journalist and by his detractors as being consumed by hatred of the media and the Murdoch empire. Nick Davies is in Australia for the Wheeler Centre, talking about his book Hack Attack, How the Truth Caught Up with Rupert Murdoch. The question is, has it? Would you please welcome Nick Davies. <laughs> So, go back to that moment when you, when you had the story. What was going through your mind? Well, right back at the beginning in 2009, so, yeah. what's going through your mind is, I can cause an enormous amount of trouble here. Because from the outset, I had this one really, really good source who had got in touch with me, a man I'd never met. And he explained, first of all, there's this newspaper that systematically commits crime. Secondly, most important, the police know all about it. They're sitting on the evidence of thousands of victims, all these perpetrators inside the newspaper, and they're not doing anything about it because they're scared of a guy called Rupert. So for, immediately you've got crime and cover-up, which are two great components. You know and, you can cause trouble. And also there's a guy called Rupert that's terrifying. That's, that, like, that just <laughs> it's kind of contradiction in terms. Yeah, yeah, it is a bad name. And also... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but by, by that time also what had happened was that the guy who'd been editing the newspaper when it's committing all this crime has gone to work for David Cameron, who's clearly about to become Prime Minister. And the difficulty is, you know the truth, you know how much trouble potentially you can cause, but because you're dealing with liars, very, very aggressive liars in Murdoch's company and the police, you've got to be able to prove every damn word of it. That's what takes the time. Yeah, I was just thinking then, even that sentence you said, you better be able to back that up with evidence. Yeah. It's, the, you had informed... Are you challenging me here? No, I'm not challenging. I'm not... <laughs> Relax. I, I am not that foolish. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so were you scared, though? Like, given, as you said, the, these powerful people that, yeah. that you had dirt on, mm -hmm. were you scared about what they might do to you? Yeah, they don't do physical violence. I've never, ever heard of Murdoch conspiring to murder anyone. At least he hasn't come across you so far, so it hasn't that's, happened. Yeah, that's, but, I think that's the nicest thing okay, anyone said about but, Rupert Murdoch on this show so far. OK, but what, what he does do, which, which is worrying, is reputational violence. So, in particular, those newspapers go after people's sex lives. You have a sex life, Charlie. How dare you? <laughs> so, it's, it's a weird thing that... So, people in this audience have no reason at all to be frightened of Rupert. Ordinary people aren't fr frightened of him. They may even hold him in some contempt because he's a greedy powermonger, brackets allegedly. <laughs> but <laughs> in amongst the most powerful members of any society where he operates, they are scared. So, if you look at the MPs in the House of Commons, they all have friends who are MPs who've had their sex lives turned over on the front page of Rupert Murdoch's newspaper. And that's painful and humiliating. Yeah, and or, so, or have a great sex life. They really yeah. enjoy it, yeah. <laughs> have a good one, so, great so story to tell. People are scared of that. Yeah. So, so, genuinely, from the outset, the editor and I think that's not much fun if that's going to happen. So the best... You remember there used to be those people who would turn up on stage in boring Sunday night TV shows spinning plates on the tops of sticks, yes. right? And as long as you keep spinning it, it won't fall down. So our theory was as long as we keep publishing stories, he can't do that to us because it'll be too brazenly obvious. But other people, politicians and lawyers who were helping us, they had a private investigator put on their tail to try to catch them sleeping with somebody they weren't supposed to be sleeping with so that he could do them damage. Right. He's a funny little private investigator. He calls himself Silent Shadow. His real name is Derek. <laughs> <laughs> See why he calls himself Silent Shadow. Well, well, you, like, you, like, Silent Shadow is a good nickname, right? But you, yeah. you actually had code names for your informants as well. Like, I, I was reading... One was called, like, Diamond, Lola, Sant, Mango. This is in writing the D book. In writing the book, yeah. yeah. When, when you gave everyone a, a code name in the book... Yeah. Surely Silent Shadow is a bit more badass than Mango. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, that's just because over and over again when you're a reporter, the people who've got the best information, the most exciting stuff, are scared of being identified because they're going to get beaten up or divorced or arrested or whatever it was. And people are frightened of Rupert Murdoch. So we were getting masses of information from journalists who'd worked for him or who were executives who were quite close to him 
it's, but the one e thing that makes it very easy to write about someone like Murdoch is that he spent, what, 60 years accumulating money and power. And you can't do that by being nice to people. You have to be brutal and selfish. And therefore, he's alienated people all down the track. So potentially, there's all these people who will talk as long as you can protect their identities. So this essentially was a story about a newspaper not playing by the rules and often mm -hmm. by the laws in getting their stories. Have, have you always played by the rules getting you your see, stories? The difference between me and the, the tabloid reporters isn't that we're, I'm morally better than them. It's, I work for The Guardian, which belongs to a trust. It's not a profit-hungry corporation. And it's kind of soft around there. So if I, if I get sent out to get some information and I can't get it, I come back and say, I couldn't get some information. They say, OK, never mind, do something else. Whereas <laughs> if you come back to a tabloid newsroom and say, I failed, they will kick your ass. They will be brutally bullying towards you. And so that means their reporters go out in a state of fear because they're constantly being bullied and therefore they're compelled to do horrible things. Yeah, they're but you're avoiding people. the question, have you always played by no, the no, rules? No, <laughs> I just haven't had to. I'm just not claiming to be a saint. I just right. haven't had to do it, that's all, because there hasn't been that kind of pressure on me. So of everything they did, and, and obviously, the, like, the Millie Dowler story was the one mm. that I think <clears throat> captured the emotions of, of, of the public. Yeah. But of everything they did, what do you think was the worst thing? There's a different thing, which is that you, you know Rebecca Brooks, who'd edited The News of the World and The Sun, and Andy Coulson, who'd edited The News of the World. Those two people had earned an enormous amount of money and acquired great power by exposing other people for having affairs with people they weren't married to. They'd ruined marriages, careers and lives by doing that. And yet it emerged in the big trial that all through that period, the two of them were secretly having an affair, cheating on their own marriage partners. Now, that's breathtaking hypocrisy and cruelty because you're ruining people's lives. And it's also, it's an important fiction for them because in order to try to justify coming in your bedroom and exposing whatever it is you do... <laughs> they Once again, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> so, but they have to pretend that we're all living on some sort of Victorian moral template where we only ever sleep with people we're married to and even then it's some kind of conventional missionary deal. So that, but they know Once very... Once again, how dare you? Yeah. So, <laughs> so they know very well that's fiction because they themselves are living by different rules, but they pretend that we're all living by that old-fashioned template so that they can try to justify doing what they're doing. And, of course, it's got nothing to do with morality. It's to do with selling newspapers because we still have this horrible thing where we like looking through a keyhole into somebody else's bedroom, even if that does ruin their lives. But the hypocrisy, anyway, is stunning. But this was the most popular newspaper in, in the UK at the time? By the News of the World was the most popular newspaper in the English-speaking world. In the English-speaking world. Yes, so, obviously, there were people who, who loved this stuff. Oh, no, yeah, it's, it's horrible human weakness, And you took it? that away from those people. Actually, that was accidental. I never, ever... It never occurred to me that that newspaper would be closed. But that's how Murdoch operates. That was very, very ruthless. We'll sacrifice, let's say, 200 jobs to preserve our own, to preserve our own position. Completely selfish and ruthless and unnecessary, really. OK, do you hate Rupert Murdoch? No, I kind of feel sorry for him. Because there he is, I think he's 84 now. He spent, let's say, the last 64 years earning money. Well, what's the point of doing that? I mean, if you actually ask what life's for, probably you didn't want to get this philosophical, did you? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a terrible waste of a human life. And I think he's driven by something he doesn't understand. Like, you know his father, Sir Keith? Very powerful, patriarchic, patriarchal figure. I think Rupert's problem is that as a child he was grown up understanding that he wasn't good enough to be his father's son. And he's desperately trying to prove, if I earn more money, if I get more power, would my dad love me? Well, his dad's dead, he can't say, enough, Rupert, enough, enough destruction, enough money. Lay off, enjoy your life. There yeah, he is, he's build, still doing it. Build a yacht. So I don't hate go him to the at moon. all. <laughs> I, but I do think... You know, you said a moment ago, it's really a story about these journalists doing terrible things. Actually, it isn't about that. That's where it starts. It's about power. And a man who comes along and looks at the governments which we've elected, you know, that funny idea about democracy we once had. <laughs> that old gag. Yeah. And then, then there's one man, one woman, one... That, nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> and along comes the former Australian with an American passport and tells our government what to do. That's what's outrageous. That's what that book's about. That's why it's worth working on for six years, because you're exposing abuse of power, which really, really shouldn't be allowed to happen. Uh, to some extent, this turned the, the newspaper business upside down. It, it, turned a lot of British society upside down mm -hmm. and government and the police. It would have turned your life upside down as well. Do you feel like it's been worth it? It's not like there's no more gutter press? Well, it's, it's just about worth it. I mean, it was fun causing trouble. I, I acknowledge that. And the trouble <laughs> went to the top of the tree, so that's OK. But the journalist fantasy that gets you out of bed in the morning is that if you write about a bad thing, then the bad thing will stop. That isn't what happens. You write about the bad thing, the people who are responsible get furious and run around shouting at you and threatening to sue you and then they carry on as ever. So, although we caused a lot of trouble, actually almost nothing has changed. 
So I think the crime levels in British newspapers have fallen to zero for a while. Beyond that, they're still unregulated, they still invade people's privacy, they still use falsehood and distortion in a horrific way. And the, the structures of power, Rupert Murdoch still bullies governments, he ain't going to stop. Well, one good thing to come from it is this conversation. Also, it's changed you... my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick Davies' book, Hack Attack, How the Truth Caught Up with Rupert Murdoch, is out now. Nick Davies, thank you so much for your time. OK, thanks for having me. <laughs>